Well, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 to start out with. Um, this is the second week in our study through uh, this, this series, rather, called What Happens When We Worship. And if you are new with us, what we tend to do, of course, is it's called expositional preaching. We work our way through books of the Bible, kind of one book at a time, and sometimes that takes six months, sometimes it takes nine months. Uh, in the case of John's Gospel, it took 14 or 15 months. Um, so that's what we're doing about 90% of the time, but sometimes we take a break from our expositional approach and we look at a particular series. Now, when we do that, of course, we're still in the Bible, we're still preaching through a text, but we may hop around uh, during that series in, in a different text uh, each week. And so this morning we're going to be looking at Hebrews 10 and also Hebrews 12, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. And last week I introduced this series by uh, giving the reason for it, the explanation for this particular series. And I explained that since COVID-19, while most people aren't dropping out of church altogether, most people aren't, uh, we see many, many people who are attending, participating much less frequently. I think the number is something like the average church member now gathers on the Lord's Day 1.9 Sundays a month. So that's obviously less than half of the time. That's 23 Sundays a month. And, and, I, and there, of course, there are a lot of reasons for this, and people have posited a lot of different explanations, and I think there's no sil silver bullet here. I think a big part of it probably has to do with just the overall busyness, We're over, our overall business. I mean, it was the Christian uh, sociologist Lyle Schaller who said that, uh, that the frenetic pace of the American lifestyle, the frenetic pace, this means running to and fro, is what has uh, sidetracked many believers from the gathered assembly. So I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but I think one of the reasons that participation is down is actually a theological reason. And by that, I mean, I, I wonder how much we realize or understand what exactly is taking place when we gather together uh, as God's people. So what we're going to do during this series is we're going to look at what God does when we come together. We're so accustomed, I think, to, to looking at these gatherings, and I totally understand it and, and do this often myself, thinking about what we're doing for God, what we're doing to God. We're singing praises to Him. We're praying to Him, right? We're giving to Him. That I, I think sometimes we, we fail to realize what exactly God is doing for us. And you've probably heard, you've heard preachers say many times, you know, the Lord used this particular sermon prep in my heart, in my life, long before I got to preach it. And that was absolutely the case for me this week in my sermon prep. The Lord really took me to school, uh, as it were, when it comes to what, what worship is. And I was so encouraged by the, the scriptures this week, and I hope the Lord does the same thing. So here's kind of our outline. This will be where we go. So this morning, what happens when we gather? That's what we're going to look at. What does the Lord do when we gather together? Next week, what happens when we give? Then what happens when we preach? Now you, you More like what happens when the Word is preached. Most of you won't be preaching. But what happens when the Word is preached? What happens when we serve? What does God do in us when we serve? What happens when we pray? And then what happens when we feast? This is a reference to the Lord's table. So what is the Lord doing in us and through us as we gather together as a body and we participate in these, these elements. Um, this morning, again, I want to look at what happens when we gather. What does the Lord do when His people gather in His name? And I'm going to give you the single point of this sermon. So there's one single point that I want to kind of unpack it in, in three uh, sub-points. So here's the, the big idea, the single point of this, this message. When we gather, God meets with us in a unique and supernatural way a way that cannot be replicated elsewhere. So what I'm going to present to you from the Scripture, again, the Lord really opened my eyes to this this week, and I'm grateful for it. What happens, what does the Lord do when we gather? Well, He actually meets with us in a unique and supernatural way, and it's a way that cannot be replicated uh, by any other experience or anywhere else. Now, I know, of course, the statement, that that main point may raise some questions, uh, like, for example, well, can't I meet with God anywhere? I mean, can, I, can I meet with God you know, out in the field, on a hike, on the lake, at, at the beach, whatever? Um, and if God is omnipresent, always fully everywhere at the same time, 100% present, 
then how can it be that he meets with us in a unique way at a different time? In other words, how can he, if he's always fully present, how can he be more present at any other time? And these are good questions that I hope that we're gonna, we'll get to, we'll answer from the text. Um, let me start by reading Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. The word of the Lord reads this way. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I mentioned this last week. We we, we often refer to Hebrews as a letter, and that's totally fine. Um, But it was actually a written sermon delivered toward the latter part of the first century when Christians were under great persecution. In fact, they were under the greatest persecution that Christians had suffered you know, up to that point, uh, the Christian faith, the church being you know, new. Uh, now, the reality is there's actually more persecution of Christians now than there ever has been at any point in history. More governments hostile to the Christian faith, more Christians being victim, victim of violence and so on, than at any other point. In fact, I just read an email this morning uh, that said that all churches in one Indian state have been ordered to stop meeting. Uh, the persecution of Christians, violence against Christians in this particular area of India has intensified, has magnified greatly. Over the past few weeks and months, uh, a number of Christians have suffered uh, from violence because of their allegiance to Christ. This is in, of course, this is going on in parts of Nepal and parts of India and all around the world. Violence, beatings, threats are a regular part of many believers' lives. There's never been a time when more Christians have been persecuted than right now. But when this letter was written, persecution had reached a fever pitch. It's roughly early 60s AD. And remarkably, some of the Jewish Christians who had been expelled by Rome by Claudius in AD 49, had actually returned home. We don't know all the reasons. Some had returned home likely to share, continue to share Christ. Some had returned home to take advantage of a thriving sort of economic situation. Um, but when they get home, the problem is that Nero is now in charge. And if you know anything about Nero, he persecuted believers in Uh, unbelievably heinous ways and creative ways. He actually tried to dream up new ways to persecute those who were followers of Jesus because they were were monotheistic. Christians were monotheistic. They worshiped only one God. Uh, They refused to worship any other God than the God of Israel. And so some of these believers at Rome are being persecuted. They're actually experiencing persecution. Um, Others are in danger of being persecuted, and still others are are sort of sequestering away, leaving the church, and they're saying to themselves, we don't want the sort of exposure that comes with being with God's people, so rather than being with God's people, we're going to stay away and not get the spotlight on us. Some of you know I was in Nepal a little over a month ago, and there were 25 of us pastors from across the country as far north as Minnesota, northern Michigan, as far south as South Florida, and west as California, so from all over. There are 25 of us, and when we got there, our Nepali leader said, mostly white, 25 mostly white pastors you know, from the states, and he said, it's really not going to be wise. In fact, it would be very dangerous for all 25 of you to go to the places we're going to go. So he said, I'm going to divide you up into three groups of eight, roughly, and And we'll go, we'll take a a van and we'll go to different places. He said, you don't want the negative attention, especially in some of these villages sort of governed by radical Hindus that you would experience if all 25 of you showed up. You don't want that attention. Well, there were Christians in the middle part of the first century who were saying, we don't want the attention. We don't want Nero's spotlight on us. So we're going to stop gathering altogether. We're not meeting with the church. We're not meeting with God's gathered assembly. It's just not worth it. 
And the writer of Hebrews will say, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. He will go on to explain, which we'll look at. He addresses those who have taken this approach in verse 25, who says, don't uh, neglect to meet as is the habit of some. Uh, He goes on to say, again, I'm going to show you what you're missing here in this sermon. What does he say they're missing? Well, an opportunity to meet with God in a unique way. As I mentioned last week, the recipients of this written sermon were, were mostly Jewish folks, and they knew their Bibles, what we call the Old Testament. They knew the Hebrew Scriptures, and they knew that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, God made His dwelling, His unique dwelling, in a specific place. They also knew that God met with His people when they worshipped Him, but in their minds, you know, learning from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Scriptures, in their minds, the location was of supreme importance. The house of worship is where God could be reached. And God has, had a specific house, uh, the tabernacle. In Exodus 25, we read, Let them make me a sanctuary, this is the Lord speaking, that I may dwell in their midst. So the sanctuary, the tabernacle, which accompany the Jews throughout their journey, throughout the desert, uh, throughout the wilderness, as they traveled from Mount Sinai to the land of Israel, was a place where God made His unique dwelling. And even more specifically, within the sanctuary, there was the Holy of Holies, the King James calls it the most holy place, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant resided, and it was there that God could be approached by the priest. Exodus 25 goes on to say, And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, the Lord says, and from above above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you. So it was there in that very unique, specific location that God could be reached. It was there that God's people, by way of a representative, could meet with Him. Once a year, the priest would offer the blood sacrifice for the sins of the people at the mercy seat. But all of this was a foreshadowing of Christ who would offer Himself, the perfect Lamb of God, for our sins. And now, back to Hebrews 10, verse 20, through this new and living way, Christ Himself, that He opened up for us through the curtain that is His own flesh, we can enter into the dwelling place of God, so to speak with full assurance that not only will we meet God there, but we can go with boldness now in Christ, knowing that because of Christ, God will actually delight in meeting us there. So I'm going to make the case for this main point that I gave you a minute ago by three sub-points, and they build on each other. Here's the first one. Through Jesus Christ, we gain direct access to God. It's a simple premise. It's a glorious premise that, again, we will build on. There was a time, and the recipients of this letter knew this well. In fact, it was all some of them knew. There was a time when God's people could only approach God through the administrations of a human priest, complete with the sacrifice of an animal's blood in order to to appease the wrath of a holy God. When the people of the Old Covenant wanted to meet with God, there had to be the shedding of blood. Every meeting of this nature required another sacrifice. Otherwise, the people dare not approach God. But today, people who put their trust in Jesus stand before an open door. A Savior with His arms extended, welcoming, embracing, inviting them into the very presence of God. There's no need for an animal sacrifice. Christ was the perfect, sufficient, one-for-all sacrifice for those who would trust in His name. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter uh, how sinful they've been, their best acts, their worst acts. The only criterion is faith in the work of Jesus. His shed body on the cross as payment for our sins. That's all it takes to draw near to God. Belief in Jesus and what He has done, which is just another way of saying the gospel. In order to draw near to God, all we need is belief in the gospel and earnest trust in Jesus and what He has done. Francis Schaeffer 
mentioned him maybe a couple of months ago, who's influenced so many people, people that you likely know and read, and had this incredible testimony where God called him into vocational ministry through three successive uh, coin flips. But, but he would say, um, the central message of biblical Christianity is the possibility of men and women approaching God through the work of Christ. Now, you may think you're not worthy to approach a holy God, and that's absolutely true, and neither am I, not by a long shot. You may think because of what you did this morning or earlier this week or maybe at some point way back in your life, some secret sin you've committed, you may think you've not done enough to earn an audience with God. And if you think that, you're right. You're absolutely right, and certainly neither have I. But the one who is worthy has paved the way for you. The one who is worthy, Jesus, has opened up the way to God by His life, His death, His resurrection, so that now those who trust in Christ have free and direct access to God. And when you come to God, this is pretty incredible, He doesn't begrudge your presence. Uh, He's not annoyed that you have approached Him. He's not reluctant to listen. He actually delights in you. He's thrilled to see you in a manner of speaking. Janine said to me the other day, I I think I'm jealous of my co-worker because she sees her grandson every every day. And as soon as she walks in a room, uh, this co-worker of Janine said that, Uh, Her grandson just starts jumping up and down on the crib, extends his arms. He's got this big smile on his face. He's so glad to see her. Well, that's kind of how God is. I mean, God obviously is not not a child, but he is enthusiastic when his people come to him, when his people draw near to him. When I lived in Southern California, I developed a friendship with a guy who, uh, about the same age, and we played softball together and played basketball together and hung around a lot. He, He he was a cement worker. He poured cement for a living and had a very flexible schedule. Uh, but we just really hit it off and, and developed a great friendship. And he said to me, hey, what do you think about getting together every Thursday afternoon toward the end of the day and, and praying for an hour? And I said, oh, I mean, that, that sounds great. But have you ever tried to pray with somebody for an hour? I mean, when it was my turn, I would pray for what seemed like 20 minutes, and I looked down, it was 30 seconds. I mean, it's hard to pray with someone for an hour. Um, but as I met with this guy week after week, uh, and sometimes admittedly, I mean, by my own admission, sometimes I was kind of begrudging it because I'm thinking this is, this is hard to do. Uh, but but I, I learned from him. His approach to prayer was, was so infectious. He was so blown away that he actually could gain an audience with the living God, the God of the universe. And as I saw his enthusiasm... And I saw the way that he approached prayer. It really did kind of rub off on me. I was blown away by that. Now, this passage has less to do with an individual's prayer time, although certainly applies to that, uh, or two guys praying together. This is about corporate worship. Again, uh, verses 24 and 25, where the writer says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing approach. So this, this is about, this is a sermon addressed to God's people whom the preacher actually knows. And this is about what happens when God's people gather. It's, it's in that gathered assembly that the writer of Hebrews has in mind here that God delights in meeting with us. Because of Jesus, we have direct access to God. Well, of course, that begs a second question, where is Jesus? So because of Jesus, we, bear, we, we gain direct access to God. Well, where is Jesus and where does that access take us? Well, there was a time, as we just saw, when meeting with God required coming to a special location, the sanctuary, the tabernacle. There was a time when God made His specific dwelling, unique dwelling, in a unique location. They called it The tabernacle was also called the tent of meeting. It was there that you met with God, but not anymore. Earlier in the same sermon, Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2, the writer says, Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, 
a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. So the writer of Hebrews equates the holy places with heaven. And the real tent of meeting, the fulfillment of all that, the real tent of meeting is actually in heaven where Christ is. This is where Jesus is. So I made the point that we have direct access to God through Christ. Here's the second sub-point. Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father. So right now, Jesus is in the heavens. We saw this in, in our study through 1 John, which uh, we, we looked at for a few months. Right now, at this very moment, Jesus is present at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me, His brothers and sisters in Christ. When we sin, and I love this, I love this uh, parenthetical, even while we are sinning, you think, oh, I'm sinning right now. I've I've not been able to resist temptation. I'm doing the same thing again. Surely God has turned His face against me. Surely Jesus wants nothing to do with me. No. He is at the very moment that we are sinning, pleading our case before the Father. Of course, He's not saying that guy down there is not sinning or that woman down there is not sinning. But what He is saying is, I paid for that sin. That one right there, she's mine. That one right there, he belongs to me. There is no condemnation for him. He is my brother whom I bought at great price. She is my sister whom I redeemed with my blood. Right now, as our advocate, Jesus is pleading our case successfully. In every way that we fail to meet God's standard of perfection outlined in the law of God, Jesus says, I was obedient in that area for him. I was obedient in every area. I fulfilled every aspect of the law for her. So that even while we are sinning, Jesus pleads our case. And the Father is not reluctant to hear from the Son. The Father sees us as righteous, gladly because of Christ, because He regards Jesus' life and death as sufficient for us as our substitute. So, We have direct access to God through Jesus. Jesus is right now in heaven. But what does that mean for us? And this is where it gets really, really fascinating. So flip a couple of pages over to Hebrews 12. And let me read verses 19 through 24. For you've not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words Make the heavens beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God. Let me read that verse 23 again. To the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, of course, if we were preaching through Hebrews, which hopefully we'll do one day, we would spend much more time unpacking this, but this is so rich. And I want to talk a little bit about the comparison between the the two mountains and what this means. The mountain that I just read about in verses 18 through 21 is Mount Sinai, where Moses brought the people of Israel after God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And Moses brought them there, of course, to meet with God. But they dare not approach God. They dare not come near that mountain because what happened if they got near the mountain? They would die. They dare not approach that mountain. God was too terrifying. They could not survive if they approached that mountain. The writer of Hebrews says, There was a time when approaching God was a fatal proposition. The mountain from which God spoke was a place of fire. This is not the kind of fire you cozy up to at night. This is the kind of fire that consumed everything around it. The mountain from which God gave His law was the place, verse 18, of darkness and gloom and tempest. There was a trumpet blast and a voice of thunder that struck abject fear in those who came near it. It terrified the people. 
so they dare not approach God in this way. But the writer goes on to say, you've not come to Mount Sinai. You've come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a euphemism for heaven. It's in the New Testament, Mount Zion is used metaphorically to refer to the city of God, Jerusalem, the new heavenly Jerusalem, God's holy eternal city. Mount Sinai represents the law of Moses, the law of God, which condemns. Mount Zion corresponds to the gospel of God, His rescue, His grace in Jesus Christ. Because of their sin and rebellion, the people were unable to approach Mount Sinai, the mountain of the law of God, lest they die. But because of the law-keeping Savior, Jesus Christ, the better Moses, the people could draw near to Mount Zion, the mountain of God's grace. Now, I happened to see this week, I don't even know what I was watching, but I saw a promo for the upcoming episodes of this show, The Chosen. Right? I'm sure you've heard of this, and I've, actually, I've never seen the show. I've never seen a single episode, which, I mean, for no other reason, I just haven't gotten around to it, I think. But in this particular promo that I saw this week for, and maybe it's for an episode that's already aired, but Jesus is confronted And he's threatened to be judged by the law of Moses. And Jesus responds by saying emphatically, I am the law of Moses. But that's blatantly unbiblical. This is actually, this is very specific Mormon teaching. It comes right from a book of Mormon. Jesus is not the law of Moses. He is the embodiment of the grace of God. The law of Moses condemns. Jesus liberates and frees. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses, sure. Jesus perfectly obeyed the law of Moses, but He was not the law of Moses. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's actually a very big deal because if Jesus were the law of Moses, He cannot be our Savior. The law of Moses condemns. The law of Moses shows us our need for a Savior, but that Savior... Jesus Christ fulfilled, kept, and died under the law so that we could be free from its condemnation. What we need is a Savior. We don't need a Savior who is purportedly the law of Moses. I'm not saying stop watching that. Again, I've not watched it, but I do think we need to watch any sort of representation of the biblical story with great discernment. But again, thank you. Someone has spoken back to me today. Uh, Well, so Mount Sinai represents the law, which spelled death. Mount Zion represents heaven where God is. And here's what's so incredible. The text tells us that's where Jesus is, seated next to God. And that's where Jesus brings us when we worship God together. The context, remember, is all about the gathered assembly. This is about corporate worship. Do you see where this is going? Through Jesus, we have direct access to God. Where is Jesus? Seated next to God in the heavenly realms. And that leads us to our final sub-point. When God's people gather in worship, they are mysteriously ushered into the heavenly realms by the Holy Spirit where they meet with God. Now you say, that sounds like some real science fiction stuff. Well, it is supernatural, and it is mysterious, but this is what the text tells us. When we, as Capshaw Baptist Church, unite together on the Lord's Day, like we're doing this morning, God meets with us in a supernatural way. In fact, something supernatural happens in a way that we don't realize or fully grasp. We are drawn by a mysterious work by the Holy Spirit into the heavenly places where we meet with God. I read where one pastor said, if if we could blow the roof off of the, the auditorium and actually, uh, when we were worshiping on a given Sunday, and, and, and we were given a glimpse into the heavenly worship that we are participating in, no one would ever doze off. No one would ever fall asleep because we would actually see what we are participating in, what we are actively involved in when God's people worship. When we gather together in corporate worship, we meet with God in a unique and supernatural way. We are ushered into the very presence of God, and the angels and the hosts of heaven 
praising together with us. Now, some of you say, yeah, but can I meet God anywhere? Isn't He fully present everywhere at the same time? We confess about God His omnipresence. Well, theologians talk about God's spatial and spiritual presence. God's spatial presence, every time I say this, I have to clarify, this is not me trying to say special with a southern accent. I'm not saying God's spatial presence. Um, God's spatial presence is where He is everywhere, all the time, fully at the same time. So He is fully present always, spatially, right? It refers to the fact that He is always fully everywhere at every moment. There's no place we can go where we escape the presence of God. God is present in the totality of His being at each point in space. That's what I mean. He is spatially present. But the Bible also talks about God's spiritual presence or special presence. See this all throughout the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament. The Psalms repeatedly refer to blessings coming to those who are in God's presence. Well, since everyone is in God's presence in some way, this must mean something different. These passages talk about those who experience the special, the spiritual presence of God. God says that in the book in Psalms, that he is very near, especially close to the brokenhearted. We say, well, how can that be possible if God's fully everywhere, always at the same time? He is, in a spiritual sense, he is spiritually present to those who are hurting deeply. And he is spiritually present in a special way. He meets with his people when they gather together to worship. This is why. As great as private worship is, and it's absolutely essential to our Christian walk. And part of my regular prayer time is I begin with prayer of confession, confessing to the Lord. And then I, begin, then I go to Thanksgiving, but then moving from there there's is worship, private worship. Sometimes I don't even know what to say, so I'll go to the Psalms and I'll pray along with the song. Worship, yeah, so private worship is absolutely essential to our own spiritual growth and development. And yet... As important as that is, it's it's no supplement, it's no replacement for public worship, corporate worship. This is why as great and important as private worship is, public worship is of even greater value and preferred by the Lord Himself. Yes, the Lord loves it when we gather and worship Him privately, and that's an important part of the Christian life, right? But there's something supernatural Something unique that takes place when God's people gather together in worship. They are ushered into the very presence of God in the heavenly realms by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we might ask, which I think is a great question, what does God actually do when we gather together and we worship Him when we're ushered into the heavenly realms? Well, the answer is He reminds us that we are forgiven. He assures us of His love for us. He comforts us in a way that cannot be described in words. He ushers us into His peace and surrounds us with His spiritual presence. And many of you, I'm sure, have, you've, you've left a, a gathered worship service with God's people and you've walked out and you've been deeply moved or encouraged. You have experienced the very presence of God in reassuring you of His love, of confirming to you that you are indeed forgiven. You ever heard of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Some people suffer from worse cases than others, and so, uh, social media is a great uh, contributor to this. You see your friends, you know, having a blast, or you see your friends and everybody, even their little children, everybody's smiling perfectly, and, or they're at an event or whatever it is. You think, man, I, I'm really, I wish I were there. I wish I was part of that. Well, if we really understood what happens when we gather together in worship, we'd actually have a healthy sense of FOMO. I don't want to miss what goes on when God's people gather with Him. Speaking about what happens when God's people gather, the great pastor, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, it is only when I'm near to God in Christ that I know my sins are forgiven. I feel His love. I know that I am His child, and I enjoy the priceless blessings of peace with God and peace within and peace with others. 
I am aware of his love, and I am given a joy that the world can neither give nor take away. And of course, he's talking, he's commenting on Hebrews 12, and he's talking about corporate worship. He says, when I am with God's people, I am more acutely aware of God's love for me and the forgiveness that I've received in Christ than at any point in my life. Do you want to meet with God? Do you want to know that your sins are forgiven? Do you want to be assured of His love for you? Are you desperate for real peace? Yes. Then go to worship. Participate in worship like you've done today. Make it your pattern. Let your kids know on Sundays, on the Lord's Day, we will be with our church family. Yes, take some vacations. Go to the beach. Travel cross country. Enjoy an extended weekend. Those are all good things. I love all those things. Those are good things. But make it your pattern. Make it your habit to be in church on the Lord's Day. I grew up with a single mom who was just trying to keep things together half the time. Uh, But when God brought her to saving faith, there was never any question on Sunday morning what we were doing. For that matter, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Sunday night, a whole bunch of nights. But when God's people gathered together, we were going to be with them. There were times I delivered the Dayton Daily News every Sunday morning, and, you know, delivered at 5 o'clock, get back about 7, 7, 15. I would always crawl back in bed. And I would every Sunday hope that my mom would forget to come in and wake me up and drag me to church. But she never forgot. There was never, ever any question. It was when it was cold, when it was hot. When it rained, when it shined, on good days and bad days. No, yeah, we took vacations. I'm not, we were with the Lord's people. So if you want to know the assurance of God's love, just be able to fully comprehend the forgiveness that is ours in Christ. Make it your pattern to be with God's people because therein you will be transformed. You will be ushered into the very presence of God in heaven in a way, of course, we don't fully comprehend. But only there will we enjoy the kind of supernatural meeting with God that leads to all the things that I mentioned, the assurance of faith, the experience of your pardon for sin, the peace that endures. Only there will your private and personal worship be fed and fueled in such a way that you can rejoice with God in times of trouble. Let's pray.